they're kind of predicting Holocaust 2.0 JW edition, where all the witnesses are kind of rounded up and, and persecuted. You'll see like kind of witnesses like huddled up in a bunker or in a basement somewhere, and like a SWAT team will come in and be like, "Where are the witnesses?" Hey guys, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're listening only and you and you would prefer to see our faces, head on over to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness. It would mean a lot if you could like, subscribe, leave a comment, leave your thoughts. I do my best to respond to everyone when I can. And also just started a Patreon. Thank you so much, Tony, for being my very first patron. It means a lot. I really appreciate everyone's support. So today's guest, this is a fun little collaboration between YouTube channels. Um, this is Alt Worldly, who has a channel all about deconstructing Jehovah's Witnesses. He is a, a post-Jehovah's Witness himself, and he just talks about all the propaganda, things that he doesn't agree with, things that he thinks should be fixed. There's so much great information over there, so I cannot wait to have him on the show and discuss this further. So welcome, Jake! Hey, thanks so much for having me, Shalise. Yeah, of course. It's awesome to have you here and um, a fellow YouTuber, one who is very experienced, so I'm just trying to get to your level. Oh, brother. Aim higher. You can. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can shoot past it. <laughs> well, we all got to start somewhere, right? And That's you're true. doing a great job. So today we are going to dive into the ex-Jehovah's Witness, um, well, the Jehovah's Witness theology and what it's like for you as an ex-Jehovah's Witness. We are going to focus in on the doomsday Day stuff because that's the one thing that I find the most fascinating. Uh, we do have some sort of doomsday theology within Mormonism, but not nearly as intense as the Jehovah's Witnesses. So we really want to focus on what that's like, uh, how that affects someone's psyche, what it's like being basically controlled by fear, and we'll go into other fear tactics as well. But first, I would love to start with your story, a little background about you so people can know where you're coming from. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I think, a fourth generation Jehovah's Witness, if wow. I'm counting my generations correctly. Um, so my great grandparents, uh, going way back, were witnesses. And all around the area where I am now in, in central Ohio. So our family was very well known in the area. Um, you know, I, I think the LDS religion seems very similar in that it's very close knit. And the communities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of uh, crossover. If you know somebody, you're only ever like six degrees of se seven, seven bacon. That's all I'm trying to say. Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> you're six degrees of seven bacon away. Yeah. I don't know how I mess it up so bad. But yeah, everyone's six degrees of seven bacon away from each other. And uh -huh. so, Makes you know, sense. growing up, <laughs> everybody kind of knew my, my family. So that was both nice and, and kind of intimidating. Um, but I had a great you know, childhood. I had kind of an idyllic witness experience. Uh, my whole large extended family was in the organization. And um, so I, I had a really about as good as an experience a, as you can have. I had very loving parents, really no crazy family drama or anything. And so a lot of my uh, – the, the male patriarchs in the family were elders. The elder – Situation is different uh, among witnesses than it is for Mormons. We maybe get into that later, but yeah, the men in my family were, were, were higher ups in the church, and so I was kind of on that path as well. Uh, and within the last couple of years, uh, probably when I was I'm 30 now, so I think probably when I was 27, uh, I, had, I, I was just newly married actually to to a witness because we we stay married with within the religion marry only in the lord as we say mm -hmm. um oh. really just a couple months after that i started to have some real serious questions and concerns based around uh video material the organization was putting out uh something about it just started to strike me as potentially manipulative and i i basically just started to worry about this question of like what if i'm wrong mm. <laughs> like if i'm wrong how would i know and i started kind of spiraling into this thing of well i'm afraid to check and i know i'm afraid to check i don't, I don't like that i'm afraid 
to check. And you mentioned in, in your intro that just psychology of, of being ruled by fear, you know, that, that's not how I ever thought about my life. I, my life is full of laughter and happiness and, and nice congregations that, that I have been in throughout my entire life. But when I started to realize the disagreements that I had with the church, I now call it the church, but that's not really how witnesses would, would refer to it. They would just kind of call it the organization. Um, when I started realizing that I had these issues and also realizing that I was not allowed to do anything about them, that really started to freak me out a little bit. And I started to realize how trapped, like in my own mind I was, you know? Um, so after a few years of just kind of being in this limbo place, I, I finally started to, um, just entirely researching, trying to find the love of the organization that I had as a kid, just trying to reconnect with it. And the more I studied just from our own internal materials, of course, we're not supposed to look at anything outside the church. Um, mm -hmm. the less and less it made sense to me. And like by, uh, by this time I'm out giving Sunday sermons, you know, I'm traveling around to different congregations, giving talks, uh, and the more I'm giving these talks and the more I'm trying to prove it to myself, the less sense it's making. And I'm realizing I just don't know if I really believe in this anymore. What were some of the things that you realized specifically that didn't feel right to you or that kind of put up a red flag after being in the church for so long? The thing that kind of got me to really start thinking was this broadcast – uh, the leaders of the organization kind of put together this monthly broadcast, which is almost like a variety show in a certain way. It's like usually mm -hmm. has like a central uh, theme to it, whether it's like family or <laughs> giving money to the organization or, uh, you know, whatever. And the one broadcast uh, was about gossip and rumors. And I thought, oh, okay, it's going to be one of these talks about not being gossipy or spreading rumors about people. But one of the governing body members, so one of the central leaders of the organization is giving this talk and he's like, you know, some people have been disturbed by rumors that they've seen about uh, brothers in the organization online, on social media, like YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. And we just would never want to look at anything like that. If we saw, we wouldn't want to pass it along to anybody else because Jehovah and Jesus trust the faithful and discreet slave. That is what the collective uh, leaders are called. Uh, so they trust us, so you should trust us as well. And that just felt like, Whoa. I just had never heard it like verbalized like that. Like that's clearly something I always was supposed to believe, but it never clicked with me that I was supposed to think of it in that way. Yeah, that's it's very much like blind obedience. Like it doesn't matter what we're telling you, it's the right thing. And yeah. Mormonism has the same type of thing where they literally say, you need to doubt your doubts. Mm. Like if you have doubts, you need to doubt that you're even doubting. And like, I don't know, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard as far as <laughs> this cognitive dissonance of, oh, if you have a question, maybe you should question your questions first before you even think about asking it to one of us. Because if, if you ask it to one of us, we'll just give you this answer to have faith and pray about it. It's like this circle where you just have to make it okay in your head, even though it's clearly not okay. And they're not willing to support you in your questioning. Yes. And just don't question at all. And if you question, you might get excommunicated for even speaking up. So there's a lot of fear underlying in that as well did you feel that way yeah absolutely <laughs> which by the way when i was kind of starting my process of waking up i listened to a lot of ex-mormon stuff actually or i made post-mormon oh really uh, yeah i listened to a lot of like mormon stories and things because it was like a way to get the i don't know to hear people's stories but without hearing all the triggering language because the cultures were very similar and mm -hmm. when I heard that thing of doubt your doubts, I was like, oh, that's so ingenious, like in an evil genius kind <laughs> of way, like, oh, that <laughs> there's no way the organization isn't going to pick up on that someday, unless it's like a phrase the Mormon church is copyrighted, because that's that really is what you're supposed to do. You know? And what, what witnesses do is they say, OK, in the Garden of Eden, Satan's fundamental question to Eve was, is it really so? You know, she says, God says we can only partake of this tree of the garden. But Satan is the one who says, is that really so? Do you really think that you're going to die when you eat the fruit? So they're like, anytime you question something, they said, that's what Satan did. He is the one who instilled wow. doubt in Eve. So when I 
started to express doubts to my parents. They're like, this is, <laughs> you sound like Satan. You know, that's, that's what they said to me. Uh, so that's oh kind gosh. of the very act of, of questioning is, is satanic has its roots in Satan himself, which doesn't even make sense because of course, you know, when you're trying to convert people, you're asking them that question of, is it really so you're trying to get people to question their underlying beliefs, but you know, you're supposed to stop once you convert. Wow. That is insane to me that they're just so against critical thinking because that could translate into other areas of your life when you're not questioning, I don't know, someone that you're working for doing something sketchy and you just go along with it. And it could hurt a lot of people, that type of mentality. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's very harmful. Yeah. So, you know, it was just one of those things where I realized that I had always had a lot of things that I disagreed with, but I just had never really thought about them as like issues, really. Like the, the one thing that I always fundamentally disagreed uh, with the organization on was, was their stance on like LGBTQ rights and gay marriage and stuff like that. And it was something that was increasingly bothering me a lot. And when I started to hear that language, I was like, I'm just never going to be able to do anything about this. I'm just going to have to live the rest of my life thinking that this is wrong and just hoping that they change. And it was, yeah, it was stuff like that that really started to get me to question my underlying beliefs. How long did it take you then from questioning to actually leaving? It took a while. I mean, it from that time when I really started to question more critically, it was a year before I allowed myself to do any research online and mm. to use extracurricular sources. Um, and it was probably a year after that that I was disfellowshipped from the organization so it's probably like a two-year process overall um yeah but it was there was like just a solid year of just thinking that i was crazy and keeping all of this to myself because i knew that if i expressed this to anybody you know i, I would sound like an apostate i would sound like somebody who you know <laughs> was being influenced by satan and mm -hmm. so i just i knew i couldn't say anything and you know how it is. Like, you you know what the answer is, uh, but it just wasn't satisfying to me. And that that's what I kept on ringing up against. And I think when I had just exhausted all the things of like, you know what? I do have answers to my doubts. I just don't like any of these answers. They just don't work for me. Uh, that's when I kind of allowed myself to do research. Wow. So you were actually disfellowshipped. Are you comfortable talking about that process or how that happened? Yeah, sure. So disfellowshipping... I, I don't know all your terms, so help me out if there's like a good analog or... We have that same type of term, actually, disfellowshipped or excommunicated. I think they recently... They may have recently changed it from excommunicated to disfellowship to make it sound less, I don't know, harsh. <laughs> but yeah. It's the same overall principle where you go into a room with like 10 dudes at one table and then you're in a little chair on like across the room and you have to try and tell them why you should still be a member of the church and please because i want to get to heaven and people are <laughs> i mean like 90 percent of the time they're like yeah no you're cut off and then yeah. you have to like repent for a certain amount of time before you can get rebaptized. it's really traumatic for people. yeah that, so it's, it's very similar um not 10 guys we there was three ju oh. a, a judicial committee forms it sounds like it's very similar it's kind of a tribunal but it's just three uh, people that are like selected from the body of elders who are the, the congregation leaders. Um, and so like what I did was I started to, I started a website to, and started to post some stuff on there, uh, kind of breaking down some lies and misinformation that were on JW.org, which is Witnesses official website. And then like, I had always wanted to do YouTube. Uh, I had wanted to make content and, you know, when I, woke up and uh, suddenly I'm like, oh, I know what I could talk about. I know what I'm an expert in all of a sudden, which is my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started to make YouTube videos, but I didn't show my face. I just kind of, you know, used an avatar and, and, and talked. I saw those. Yeah. So I started to do that and I probably did that for like six to eight months or something. And then just kind of, I don't know, I just realized like it's crazy that I'm afraid as a millennial 
to show my face on the internet talking about something like it was I it was just kind of hit me like this is just another layer of fear like I'm I'm genuinely afraid of the consequences of this and even though I knew what the consequences would be it, I feel like I needed to know it for myself like I needed to know like are my parents really going to shun me Mm-mm. because of a YouTube video and the answer is yes, but I needed to know that for myself, you know. So mm. when I did that, when I showed my face, like it got found by the elders like the next day and wow. it started to spiral from there. Uh, so once that when, once I was found, it, it happened pretty fast and I had multiple meetings with the elders, um, some of which I secretly recorded, which is on the YouTube channel. Mm. Um, and yeah, so that's what the process was like. And then an announcement is made at the midweek meeting uh and it they just said you know jacob christ is no longer one of jehovah's witnesses and that is just a signal for everybody to stop talking to you and uh no matter what you do you know whether it's like something like me or i just i don't agree with the church anymore and i just wanted to talk about it or if you were to like murder somebody you know the announcement they make is the same so nobody knows what you did they just know they're not allowed to talk to you so that's that's kind of how it works and how it went down for me that is rough like i man i guess there's one difference where when you get excommunicated as a mormon there is kind of like oh what did they do it must have been bad but they almost try and love bomb you back in. So mm. it goes two ways. Like either either they stop associating with you, usually the ones that are afraid of their own salvation being tampered with, or the ones that really still care about you are like, oh, let's bring them back to God. Let's bring them back to the church and they'll support you and love you. And like, we'll do, we'll help you to do whatever it takes to get back in because we want you to go to heaven, you know? So that, wow, that's really interesting. What was that like with your family just cutting you off like that? I mean, it. I think it, it was, by the time it happened, it was inevitable because we're going to be talking about doomsday and and living under the threat of armageddon and Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like when i realized that my religion wasn't true there there wasn't really going to be an armageddon coming that was then like immediately replaced with a new armageddon in my head which is okay well now there's a ticking time bomb and i'm going to be disfellowshipped and i'm going to be shunned and that is going to blow up my entire life and that is definitely going to happen uh, yeah. And so there was, you know, like a full year of me knowing, like, this is going to happen at some point, but I don't know if I'm ready for it. And I don't know, like, when you no longer believe in it, you kind of start to realize how much every single conversation with people in the church it revolves around church stuff mm. and revolves around the religion, no matter what. Even if it's not a conversation about the religion, it will inevitably lead back to that. And so you kind of just start to feel like, you know what? I don't even know if we have anything to talk about. So it was really hard and, and, and traumatic. And, you know, I, I think my parents still don't talk to me. Um, wow. My sister, like, you know, I have a nephew who's I probably now two or something. And he's not going to remember me because I've held him as a baby. But, you know, he won't have any memory of me. So that stuff is really crappy but it also at the same time is like i think the way i had to justify it is like i I don't believe in shunning but they do so if they want to go along with that i can kind of put the ball in their court i'm going to make my stand and whatever they want to do with that is, is kind of up to them uh yeah wow that's really difficult and i think what you're doing is really brave and what the world needs to speak out about these things so that other people can be awakened to the harms that are happening within the religion and maybe it'll spark some people to do their own research and do what it takes to get out of that and be reunited with their family. So I guess if there is a silver lining, it's it's hard to say that when what you're going through is so difficult, but if there is a silver lining, it's that you're helping other people. Yeah, that's how I like to to think about it it's what it's funny too because when i was talking to the elders they're like what you you keep saying that uh what you're doing is is helping people how are you how are you helping people (laughs) how is what you're doing Mm -hmm. helpful and uh i was like well it's just helpful because it's just good to know you're not alone because when i first started going through this i thought that i was alone i just thought like oh my god i like have this great 
life? What's wrong with me? Uh, why is this not connecting with me anymore? So I, you know, I don't know how helpful it is in any like tangible way other than just like letting people know like you're not crazy this is really a real thing that you're experiencing and you can get past it kind of mm-hmm. not that i'm past it i mean i don't know i don't know if i'm the picture of mental health but <laughs> it takes a long time and that is a really interesting thing to think about when they say how are you helping people because in their minds you're destroying people's salvation and you're breaking up families however you could turn the same thing around to them and say how are you helping people by forcing my parents not to talk to me anymore how do you think that's helpful so throw the reverse uno card at them there's a lot to unpack there. So for people who don't know or aren't familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, can you give like a brief rundown of how they came to be, who they are, what they believe, that type of thing? Sure. So like Mormonism, they, they started in the 1800s in upstate New York, and they were very inspired by this kind of millenarian movement, which is focused on the return of, of Jesus um, the second coming of, of Christ, although that's not how modern day witnesses would articulate it. Uh, and basically it started as uh, like a lot of movements where the founder of our organization, Charles Says Russell, used a bunch of math that other people had used before him. But he's like, I, the end of the world, the end of everything is going to come in 1914. Um, and he What he asserted was that Jesus had begun invisibly ruling in heaven. So his presence had already started invisibly, which is convenient because you can't check. But, (laughs) you know, uh, so he, you know, got a lot of people. He's a very charismatic leader, got people involved that way in like the end is coming soon. And then, of course, that happens. 1914 came and went and the the world did not end. But World War I did happen. And so he was like, hey, wait a minute. Look, we were right about something. Something did happen. And so then they shifted the date so that 1914 was the real start of Christ's invisible presence and the end was going to come later. So they've shifted the end times more and more and now they don't give a specific date. They just say that we're in the final part of the final part of the last days. Right. But Doomsday is very central to Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, it is not, they wouldn't call it Doomsday. They would just call it Armageddon um, or Jehovah's Day. But, uh, you know, everything you're doing, the reason why, witnesses go out and preach is because the end is coming soon and you need to be on the ark so to speak you know you you need to be in the one place that uh sorry part of part of the organization that jehovah is using today you know that that's how they refer to to god the father um which is not even the most accurate way to pronounce his name, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, so yeah, like the jehovah's witnesses are basically a a group that uh, feels very strongly that Armageddon is coming soon, and they're the only group that are accurately interpreting the Bible, uh, its message, and they are the only group bearing God's name, Jehovah. Uh, so you need to you need to join. You need to join up. Okay. Yeah, Mormons have the similar look, and it's so funny. I can't wait to do our video, which when this is released it should be out at the same time click here if it's available uh (laughs) we're gonna talk all about how mormons and jehovah's witnesses are similar um so they also invented their church in upstate new york around the exact same time and also joseph smith is famous for saying the second coming will happen in our lifetime so same thing Mm -hmm. we go out and preach and say the end is coming you better get right with jesus and you better better be baptized into the one true religion on the planet and get your food storage right get your emergency kits right and it's a whole thing which we will go into depth on your video yeah but for now i really want to focus on what that was like for you growing up with this looming fear of excruciating death because what are the actual uh parameters as far as if you do x y and z you won't burn up in flames right okay so good question so so the I guess a couple things. Uh, w- one thing that witnesses and, and Mormons have in common is that we don't believe in hell fire. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you were destroyed in Armageddon, uh, or I guess if you oppose Jehovah's Witnesses specifically <laughs> before Armageddon and then die, uh, you will not be resurrected to the new world. So if you're destroyed in Armageddon, that is an eternal destruction. You're, you're, you're dead forever. No choice. No no chance of resurrection. Um, and then Armageddon, 
uh, is is very strange how witnesses have it planned out. You know, they they will say things like, "We are in the final part of the final part of the last days," um, but they don't actually think that like Armageddon itself could come tomorrow because they have this whole timeline of the way Armageddon is supposed to play out, and it's it's quite specific. Mm. They think that before Armageddon, there is going to be a period of time called the Great Tribulation which is a phrase that they get from, uh, I mean, it might be Ezekiel. It's from one of the prophetic books of the Bible um, where it talks about before the end comes, there'll be a great tribulation such as not, hasn't happened before, nor, would, nor will it occur since. I didn't grammatically say that right, but you get the idea. Uh, and so without getting into the spe- specifics of why they believe this, it's like they think that there is going to be a global cry of peace and security. There will at least appear to be peace on earth. Things will appear to be going really well. But as soon as this happens, uh, sudden destruction is to be upon them, as Jesus said in the New World Translation. So all the language I'm using for the the Bible is going to be based on the New World Translation, which is Witnesses' translation of the Bible. Um, So that, (laughs) after the crying piece of security, which they're not specific on how exactly that's going to happen, the United Nations is going to come together and ban religion worldwide. There will be a global ban <laughs> on all religions. Hmm. And witnesses will be the only group that refuses to disband. And so all of the governmental authorities are going to come for Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, if you see any kind of like cringy videos that some that people have commentated on on YouTube, like you'll see like kind of witnesses like huddled up in a bunker or in a basement somewhere and like a SWAT team will come in and be like, where are the witnesses? And that's what they're talking about. Like, so in the great, during the great tribulation, they're kind of predicting Holocaust 2.0 JW edition where all the witnesses are kind of rounded up and, and persecuted. Um, but God will not let his people be destroyed. So then Armageddon, will come and that is like the global fire and brimstone uh armageddon that you would you know think about uh traditionally and then after that you know then everything is nice and there's there's a global earthly paradise so sorry that was a long explanation but it is a convoluted mythology (laughs) i think it's important because i think there's still more to dive into that so there's an army that comes down from heaven, right? Yes. And they just like light the world on fire. But if you are a faithful Jehovah's Witness, not just a Jehovah's Witness, but a faithful one, you'll be lifted up, right? And then you get to live on the new earth. Yeah. And it's not that you'll be lifted up literally because there is this two-tiered system of salvation where 144,000 people since the death of Christ, have the opportunity to go to heaven. And there's still some now, including the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses, the governing body. They are all anointed Mm. Christians. That means they have a heavenly calling. So there's a few of those, supposedly, on earth right now. So every year when Witnesses commemorate Jesus' death, uh, you only partake of the bread and the wine if you are of the anointed. Really? Uh, So most people, yeah, most people don't do the sacrament. Uh, It's very weird. So if you go to like a memorial of witnesses, you're just going to see people passing along, but not partaking of bread and wine. It's very weird. That's Um, so interesting. Which, by the way, I talk about this in your video. There is such thing as a second anointing in Mormonism where those people are guaranteed a spot in heaven. And actually, like a lot of Mormons don't even know about this. Um, So that's interesting. And I was secret uh, menu at in and out. Um, But yeah, I think. I had the idea of being lifted up in Armageddon because that's what Mormons believe. Yeah. No, but if you look at artwork, you know, it is it is very much like that, where it'll show, like, an angel, like, standing behind these witnesses as, like, SWAT teams and soldiers are being, you know, destroyed. It's, it's, it's quite spectacular. But the, mm-hmm. the vast majority, so the 8.5 or so million Jehovah's Witnesses on Earth today have the earthly hope. They will create basically a new global Eden on earth and live forever there. 
So that is the hope that, that most witnesses have, is, is living forever on a paradise earth. And that is the thing that you are taught first as a kid. You know, you, you are shown these beautiful pictures of animals, you know, wild animals like bears and, and lions and stuff, you know, playing harmlessly with children in this paradise landscape uh, because all of the animals and humans are supposed to live together in harmony. So that's like, you know, my, my first memories as a kid uh, were not of the like Armageddon. I would wake up every morning and I would look out my window and think, oh, maybe paradise is here. Uh, and I would look out in the lawn and see if there was any like lions grazing or anything. Uh, and at some point, I don't remember when this would have happened. Uh, I was informed like, well, there's going to be a few steps before we get to paradise. <laughs> and like you said, you have to be a faithful witness. So you do have to be a witness. And um, there's a there's a quote I've got here. This is from a 1989 Watchtower. Only Jehovah's Witnesses, those of the anointed remnant and the great crowd, that's the uh, everybody who's going to live on the earth, as a united organization have, uh, under the protection of the supreme organizer, have any scriptural hope of surviving the impending end of this doomed system dominated by Satan the devil. So that's, that's kind of the framework you have. But it is not that you are guaranteed if you're a witness, because if you're a bad witness, you still might not make it. And that, I think, is where the fear comes in. <laughs> so what do they tell you makes you a bad witness? Are there clear-cut rules, or you just have to hope that you're worthy enough? That is the tricky thing, you know? Like, there are <laughs> definitely things that you are supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be regular in the uh, field ministry, so that's, like, your door-to-door -door work, which witnesses are expected to do for their entire lives to the extent that oh, they're wow. able to do so. Um, you actually have to be active in the ministry to be considered an active member. I think after six months, if you don't report any field service time, because you turn in the amount of time that you spent, you fill out like a little report. Like I spent this m amount of hours in the ministry. I placed this many magazines, showed this many videos. It's very, you wow. know, it's very organized. And uh, so if you don't turn in time, uh, and I believe it's for six months, you are you are considered inactive. Uh, so you definitely have to be active your chances aren't looking great if you're inactive. Uh, so you definitely have to be doing that. You have to be regular at the meetings, uh, participate in the meetings, because there's a lot of like Q&A, like audience participation stuff. Um, if you're given an assignment, you know, you carry out assignments. And that's kind of like, this to me is the entire constant existential crisis of, of being a witness and why I now realize why I am as neurotic and constantly worried that I have uh, upset somebody uh, that that's how I am now and I, I'm always asking my wife like is everything okay did I do anything and she's like no you're fine now I'm annoyed because <laughs> you keep asking me that and it's because you know it, everything that you do every decision that you make isn't just a decision it is a decision that can reflect well on Jehovah or bad badly on Jehovah and um, like like the cartoons that they make now for kids, there's there's one that they make that I think is like a really good visual example of kind of the way you're supposed to think about everything as a witness, which is like the protagonist, Caleb. I don't remember exactly what it is. I think he's tempted to play like a violent video game or something on some, you know, kids handheld gaming device at school. He says, no, I'm not going to play it. And like it pans up to heaven and it shows all these like, it's, you know, like a CGI Pixar looking cartoon. They're all cheering like, yay. And Jesus is cheering and it shows like Jehovah, like you know, glowing down, like, yeah, and it shows Satan, like, ah. <laughs> so wow. everything you do is to make Jehovah happy and to make Satan mad. But of course, the better you do, the angrier you make Satan, so the harder he's going to tempt you. Yeah. Well, that's ironic when they say don't, <laughs> don't play violent video games, but in your future, there's going to be a huge, disgusting, <laughs> bloody war that if you're not good enough, you're going to die. It's like, what? Uh, <laughs> the ultimate violent video game will play out before your very eyes. <laughs> you will yes. be in the video game. Yeah, it is really, it, it is annoying because there's so much war and violence in the Bible. And even as a kid, I was like, why am I allowed to read this, but I'm not allowed to play a violent video game? Mm. Anyway, so yeah, yeah. So you're never really sure exactly. Uh, and I think that's kind of part of 
the the control mechanism of the entire thing is kind of constantly keeping you on edge. Mm-hmm. Are you doing enough? And that's kind of the constant question you're supposed to be asking yourself. Like, am, am I doing enough in Jehovah's service? And there was even a talk by a governing body member not too long ago. I think it was last year at some point. And the theme of the talk was, is your best good enough? Yikes. And the, the, the whole purpose of the talk was to say like, well, maybe it is. Maybe you're doing everything you can. But are you, are you sure? You know, can you examine your circumstances and see if you can cut down on work and spend more time in the ministry? Um, you know, are you spending too much time watching TV and doing leisure activities? So there's always something that you could be doing better. So you never quite feel like you're a hundred percent guaranteed to make it. Yeah. In. Oh, that's so frustrating. <laughs> I know. So I feel like I just talked for 20 straight minutes. No, it's great. That's one of the things that drives me so crazy about these high control, high demand groups is first of all, they create the problem and then they're the only people that can offer the solution. And then on that top of that, such a good way of putting it. even with the solution, you're not good enough. So it's this violent cycle where you're like, oh, um, this thing is going wrong in my life. It must be because Jehovah's mad at me. I must need to spend less time with my family and more time bringing other people to the church. And It's just this constant cycle of I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I need to do more. And no one can have a healthy mindset. I mean, of course, I'm generalizing. Of course, everyone has their own. Like the way they justify things. Yeah. Everyone's going to react differently to this to this theology. And that's why a lot of people say, well, not all Mormons are this way or not all Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, I hear you. But the overwhelming (laughs) amount of people who are involved in high demand groups and high control groups do have some sort of repercussion that is built into their head because they've been so programmed into this mentality of you're not good enough, you're broken, and we can fix you. And that's just the reality of it. Yes. And that, what you just described is so frustrating to me because I will get, you know, witnesses who who comment or, or email me or whatever. And they're like, you know, it's not really like that or you know, not, not everybody thinks that way. And to me, it's like, but you're supposed to, like, if you're taking the doctrine seriously, you're supposed to think that way. Mm -hmm. This is what I I had a hard time getting through to my parents. It's like, I feel like I'm the only person taking all this stuff seriously. (laughs) Like, you know, I would point them to like that very quote that I read you about only witnesses surviving. I said, you know, I don't like that. We teach that only our group will survive from again. And they say, we don't, we don't teach that. I said, Mm. yes, we do. So I had to read them the quote and they're like, well, that's, that's an old quote, you know, that yeah, it was written before you were even born. And I'm like, okay, well, let me find you a newer quote. And they're like, no, you're just, you're just <laughs> looking at it wrong. I don't think that. I'm like, well, you're supposed to think that. I, I take these things seriously. <laughs> and that's kind of the thing is like, I feel like these groups kind of punish the people who are honest. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of my feeling on it. We're like, if you really do everything that you're supposed to do as a witness, you're going to be completely exhausted all the time and still falling short because you can't do everything you can't Mm -hmm. possibly be doing everything and they will acknowledge that you can't because you are imperfect but at the same time (laughs) you're supposed to try so you're supposed to try and you will fail and it's okay but also it's not you know there's just no way to know this is something that we talked about in depth on my episode of phil drysdale where he's an expert in deconstruction and he said the people that deconstruct are the ones that are the most faithful because they're the ones that are following all of the rules are the ones that are doing the most research praying reading the scriptures everything that they can do and they're the ones that find the issues with the doctrine it's it's the ones that don't really care and they're like yeah i go to church on sundays i'm a believer that just kind of go about it because it's not really affecting them in any way and they're just kind of laying low but like you said when you really do what you're supposed to if you really look at the doctrine and what you are supposed to believe it's pretty outlandish and it's not until you really dive uh, dive, dive deep into the doctrine that you realize how many issues there are with it and yes the quotes from previous leaders do matter and that's like one of my <laughs> other pet peeves where they go, well, it was like in Mormonism, it was a long time ago when they said that blacks were lesser in the pre-existent. Uh, no, mm. it wasn't. I have a quote here in the 80s. Do you think that's a long time? Like my mom was in that time period when it wasn't allowed. So that's what bothers me. Yes. 
I'm just agreeing aggressively. That's this is the thing that bothers me, you know, because my you know my great grandparents were in this, right? So they obviously they probably thought the world was going to end in 1975 because that's what witnesses were teaching at the time. So like every generation of my family has thought that they will never grow old, wow. that the end will come before they get old, and now you know my my grandparents are, are very elderly. They're they're in their eighties, and now my you know my parents are in their fifties. So they're not really like old yet, but you know they never thought they would get to be in their fifties. I never thought that I would graduate high school. I remember as a little kid thinking like, "There's no way I'm ever going to be twelve years old in this system of things." And this has just you know happened since the eighteen seventies. It's just every group of people just thinks, "No, this this time." It's going to really happen. And that's kind of, but, but the fear is that you will leave and then the end comes right when you mm-hmm. leave and you left and then, oh, because you left, then you're destroyed. So everybody has this fear of like, oh, well, of course, everybody probably thinks that the end isn't going to come. But as soon as I leave, the end will come and then I'll be killed. So I better stay in just in case. <laughs> And that's something that I want to get into. But first, I want to know, like you said, I'm not even going to make it to 12. Did that affect? I'm sure it did. Let's expand on this. How did that affect your decision making of planning for your future? Did that change the way that you went about things? Yeah. What planning for my future? I did no such thing. I did not plan for my future in any way, shape or form. I, you know, I didn't go to college this is this is a big cultural difference the witnesses are very anti higher education mm. and uh, probably because they don't own any universities but also because you know they they, don't, they want to guard against critical thinking a big difference is that witnesses really want to keep you poor so that you are more reliant on the group um and so none of, nobody in my family has any money most most witnesses are are, are pretty you know, lower class or, or middle class. Uh, and uh, so I entered like me and my wife both entered marriage with a ton of debt because we never thought we'd have to pay it off. <laughs> we never thought oh we'd have to gosh. pay it off the system of things. You know what I mean? And so now there's this reality of like, oh, crap, we really got to work on those like student loans and credit card bills and stuff. And so like another thing is like I, I wanted to go to like art school or become a English major or something and I I didn't do any of that stuff um so you just you don't think to do that and and uh one of the leaders Anthony Morris gave a, a talk a few years ago uh that's still on the website where he says you know in the new world we are not going to need doctors and lawyers but oh we gosh. will need electricians and plumbers and carpenters to help rebuild the new world so that is the kind of mentality that you that you're dealing with. Now, of course, in the meantime, the leadership is sending out letters to the elders, like, if you know anybody who has a law degree, we actually do need people at headquarters who wow. you know, work in the law. <laughs> of course, you're just kind of supposed to magically hope that you convert a lawyer. I guess it's, I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, so so you don't plan for your future. You're not in great, not in a great financial situation for the most part. Um, and yeah, it, it, that itself keeps you in, you know, to, to the fear of like doomsday and all that. There, there's a very real sense that you have and that I certainly had of like, well, I'm screwed when I leave because I don't have any outside contacts because I'm not supposed to make friends with anybody outside the organization. I don't have any savings. I don't have a place to go. Uh, my entire life is is here. So that's another form of fear that keeps you in is like not only is the end coming, but you don't have anywhere else to go in like a very real practical sense. Witnesses like to say, where else would we go in terms of a religion that meets X, Y, and Z requirements? But there's also just a very practical matter of if you're really doing everything properly, you're not supposed to have close contacts with anybody outside the organization. So you're, there's just nowhere to go, period. Um, yeah, it's all very bad. <laughs> Yeah, Mormons say that same thing. Actually, famously, maybe it was even a year or two ago, they were like, if you leave, where will you go? I mean, yeah. guys, this is the definition of using fear to control people. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to get into 
how, now that you know Jehovah's Witnesses is not a real thing, how have you been able to unwind that programming where, like you said, you have this looming fear and Mormons do too. It's like, okay, the second I leave, Jesus is going to come and I'm screwed because there's no repentance process during the mm -hmm. Armageddon. It's like, you you made your choices and that's it for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, so a couple things helped with that. You know, one, during my process of just trying to look at our own materials you know the the materials that the organization produces magazines books and, and and videos and things the whole while i'm doing what i'm supposed to do i'm praying for guidance for understanding for humility to help me accept things and yet i keep feeling like i'm being pulled in the other direction and the, what witnesses teach is that you know only jehovah and jesus can read hearts satan cannot read your heart right so to me i'm like god knows how hard i have tried and if he really does read my heart he knows that i sincerely tried as hard as i could to make this work and i i just can't and he can take that up with me anytime because it's been a one-way conversation so far mm -hmm. um so I really felt like I had reached a point where I was like, okay, this is really true. And Jehovah really is like going to read the hearts of people on the earth to see if they deserve to be killed or whatever. I feel like at least I left for sincerely conscientious reasons. Not that I even feel like you have to do that. I mean, you leave for whatever reason. I don't care. Just get out of there. <laughs> but that's that's how I felt. And then – but I did have a real moment of like, uh oh, what if I messed up at, at one point? Um, this is a little dark, but uh, I don't know. So I – I was in the I was in the hospital. I, I have Crohn's disease. I've had that since I was a little kid. And it started to get really bad when I started this questioning process because, of course, my symptoms were exacerbated by, by stress. One of the things I was experiencing with was a lot of blood loss, which ironically, you know, witnesses don't allow you to take blood transfusions. Eventually, I ended up needing multiple blood transfusions to save my life, like the week before I got this fellowship. So it ended up being a good thing. That I, uh, that I left. And, yeah, but before that, this was in the middle of COVID, right? Now, COVID itself was a global moment where witnesses felt very vindicated because this, all oh, this unprecedented thing is happening. And this is when they made this, you know, quote that has now come back to bite them of, we are in the final part of the final part of the last day, shortly before the last day of the last <laughs> days. So that has all happened. And I go to the emergency room because I'm like losing blood and stuff. And this is also the same week that the George Floyd murder happened. And so protests are going on and like I'm in the ER and I start hearing all these people coming in the trauma unit from people that have been, you know, like beaten up in, in protests and stuff. And so I'm watching like the world fall apart on the news <laughs> while I am – like, I've already internally made this decision that I don't feel like it's the truth. Yeah. And I'm like, now is going to be the time. Like, if there's anything that is a sign that Armageddon really is coming and that I'm making a terrible mistake, it is right now. Because this is very surreal. And it just, I still felt like, no, I still don't believe it. I still just don't believe it's true. I don't believe in any of the doctrines. And you know, this isn't the first pandemic that's happened ever. It's just the first that's happened in our lifetime. Um, so I don't know. I think going through something that really made me feel like, okay, it really feels like Armageddon should be coming now. Um, that was It was actually weirdly helpful because it kind of made me realize like, you know what? Even in the face of what actually kind of seems like <laughs> the end of the world, I still know that this isn't true. And... If God were to wipe me out, I don't want to serve that kind of God anyway. Like what? Because I wanted to understand better and just couldn't? That doesn't seem fair. I don't want to serve a God like that. Um, so that's that's kind of helped. I think it's amazing that you were able to have that discernment, the power of discernment in that moment, because <laughs> that would have been a life-changing or life-threatening decision if in that moment you decided, oh no, I think this is the true way and you didn't get those blood uh transfer tra what are they called uh transfusions 
if you didn't get those blood transfusions, who knows if you would be here now. So I think that's amazing that you were able to say, you know what, this isn't, no, this isn't happening. It was really crazy. So like I had two hospitalizations kind of like a year apart. And the, the second time that I was hospitalized was a time when it was like literally the week before they were going to announce my disfellowshipment. And the first time I hadn't told anybody, you know, that I didn't believe anymore, except for, um, I think my wife knew at the time. And the thing that stood out to me, I kind of forgot to say this was like, witnesses have kind of like hospital police that come around. They're called the hospital liaison committee. And it is a committee of people who like, when there is a witness in the hospital, the congregation notifies the hospital liaison committee and they come in and intercede on your behalf and let the medical staff know that this person is not supposed to receive blood and they come and check on you and make sure that you haven't been pressured to receive blood or that you haven't received any and the only reason why they didn't come and check on me is because of covid restrictions wow. and I, so i had this moment like i think the thing that made me realize like no i still don't agree with this is if they were allowed to come in and see me they would see that i don't have the standard no blood wristband around me that they give you when you're in the hospital, which I know <laughs> they give witnesses because I had gotten many of them throughout my life. And they would write like no blood on the on the dry erase board and they would have it on the thing outside your room. Uh, and the only reason why they, you know, weren't visiting me was because of COVID. But if they were, I would have been pressured and asked about this. And I would have had to admit to them that I would be comfortable receiving a blood transfusion and I would have been disfellowshipped anyway. <laughs> so it was kind of like, you know what? No matter what, I just don't think this is true. And so I think I think just knowing that it's literally not true is, is a big help. Yeah. What is the reason that they say you can't get blood transfusions? The reason why is because there's like two verses in the Bible that say not to eat blood. And one of them is part of the Mosaic law. And one of them is, uh, I think, in Acts or something. And their reasoning is that in consuming it or having it infused to your veins is the same as eating it because if a doctor told you to abstain from alcohol and you had alcohol injected into you you wouldn't be abstaining from alcohol so therefore you should not get a blood transfusion which doesn't is not great logic um mm -mm. because there are definite health negatives to just eating raw blood but there are you know <laughs> something that can save your life only good so yeah that is their reasoning is very flimsy and i think the only reason why they haven't changed it is because so many people have died from not accepting blood transfusions that they realized that they would just have the world's biggest lawsuit on their hands if they ever changed this doctrine wow yeah yeah that makes sense so then now that you're clearly out of it and you're like yeah this is definitely not true how or have you still noticed yourself with those same type of uh, thought processes where you're like, oh, um, I'm afraid of doing this or I'm bad at decision making or I'm bad at planning my future because, you know, whatever that is for you that you feel like is still programmed, how have you been able to separate yourself from that and do you notice it still popping up? Yeah, I don't, I don't have like this great fear of the end of the world in the sense that I had before, but I still do find myself getting really like existentially freaked out about you know things that could be world shaking events like you know climate change and, and things like that um the way that I, i've kind of channeled that into like a positive energy is you know I, there is going to be an end to my life so i need to make the most of the life that i have and like having a couple near-death experiences <laughs> Uh, kind of help motive and like, you know, being shunned and having all this happen in such quick succession kind of gave me this drive to be like every second that I can be doing exactly what I feel like I want to be doing. I, I want to do that. Like, so whether that's just focusing on all the things I wasn't allowed to do as a witness, like creatively or uh, politically, because we're not supposed to get involved in politics as a, as a witness, um, or, uh, you know, just, just really trying to channel that communal energy into, I, I don't know, or like getting involved in my local community in certain ways. Like I'm trying to find ways into like spin those 
the negative framing of good tendencies like just into good tendencies if that makes any sense yeah you're exploring your freedom and living life as a sovereign being that can make their own choices and do whatever they want and finding out you know the thing is people say well if you're not um if you're not governed by god like you might kill people it's like well no i i'm hoping that most people wouldn't want to do that anyway but learning yeah. that there are consequences to your decisions like yes freedom there's two sides to everything right it's amazing to go out and explore your freedom and do what you want to do and also learning for yourself that there are consequences for things but that's okay because that's part of being a human is like testing yeah. the boundaries and doing maybe doing things wrong and messing up and that's okay and you're not going to hell for it but now you've become a better person and you can figure out how to do a better job next time <laughs> So I think yeah. it's it's liberating and it's exciting as much as it is scary. Yeah, and the thing about like the Armageddon teaching that really is is quite toxic is it actually causes you to withdraw from society and your community and trying to improve the world in any material way because you're told that this system of thing, that's how they would refer to like this this world that we live in. This world is doomed. It is doomed to destruction. You like don't partake in politics or try and give to a charity or try to join some community project because those are just, you know, that that's like trying to stomp out little fleas. Whereas, you know, God is going to wipe out the whole dog. I've started that, you know, <laughs> illustration without knowing where I was going. <laughs> like, I think fleas. it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God's going to kill dogs. I mean, that's literally what they think when you think about it. Oh. But that's, uh, y yeah, like you kind of withdraw from engaging in the community other than trying to convert people by going door to door and telling them, you know, that they need to join your religion. So... You know, my, my family views what I'm doing as a purely selfish decision. They think I'm a very selfish person for doing this, which I guess in some ways is true. I do want to live my own life. But I also feel like I am far more positively involved in my community and in society than I was before. Uh, you know, I am actually concerned about trying to make the world a better place, which I was very materially like not trying to, I was very consciously avoiding forming close relationships with people, getting to know people at work or, you know, I might meet, uh, you know, people I see at the bar or the store every week, you know, I'm not supposed to be friends with those people. Whereas now I feel like I'm, I'm trying to make a more conscious effort to be like, no, Armageddon's not coming. So we need to make this world better now while, <laughs> while we still have a chance to do it. Yes, I love that. And I guess I never thought about not wanting to save the world because it's going to end anyway. It's like it's a lost cause. Don't worry about recycling. Don't worry about the oceans. Just live yeah, life. It's yeah, going to exactly. go up in flames anyway. So then what are some ways if you have any tips, tricks, tangible things that you found have helped you release this mind control or these programmed beliefs that other people can try for themselves a word of uh, a word of advice if you will sure i i really do think forming like irl human connections with people is probably the most important thing like it really you know i i feel like just kind of recently we've been able to make really good friends, like have a really solid friend group that we just know that we can rely on. They're also former, former witnesses. Um, but just like knowing that you have like real people in your life that really care about you and that like their affection for you is not determined based on your religious beliefs yeah. uh, that is a really powerful thing like it's it's a validating thing to know like people care about me as a person regardless of my beliefs because the thing that really sends me spiraling if i let myself think about it too much is the fact that like my parents like they shun me they they are willing to cut off their own child in favor of a religion in favor of of a god that they that they can't see 
Uh, so like having real like touch grass moments in your life is good. Like really trying to like form friendships and uh, I don't know, partaking in this like in a really tangible way is good. Like trying to um, trying to create stuff is, is really good too. Like for whatever that means for you. Like I, I really like doing art and writing, but I was like very consciously, I, I didn't do that stuff too much because I knew that I, that could distract from, uh, you know, the, the ministry or, or the meetings or whatever. So just like really allowing yourself to figure out what you like. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't, and I think it's actually important to have that stuff completely separate from whatever your former belief system is, because I obviously stay pretty engaged with like XJW stuff in that community. Um, but it's important to like have stuff outside of that. Like it, it's good to pull yourself out of that like rabbit hole and just like, you know, the, my entire knowledge of history was totally through the lens of the church. It was totally through the lens of there was one true organization. We are part of that organization. So everything, all of human history, when you think about it, it's kind of about us. So just like, I find such joy now in just learning stuff, just reading stuff about history that most people probably take for granted. But it's just nice. It's nice to learn things without the filter of my previous religions. I don't know. Just like try and fill your brain with cool stuff that you couldn't before and make friends. I don't know. I don't know if any of that was particularly, it wasn't succinct, I, I can tell you that. But No, I think that's helpful. I think it just goes back to finding your individuality, figuring out who you are as a person, what you like to do, who you like to be around, like you said, based on the quality of the person and not what they believe in. And also just finding your own community. And like you said, relearning um, history, relearning things with a wider perspective, a wider lens. And it's just perspective is so important. When when people leave high demand religions or organizations, I'm always just like, just take off the goggles and just reevaluate everything because that's yeah. what you have to do. You have to really tear down everything and build up the things that are important to you and build up the things that maybe are true history that you didn't know the actual truth about before. Do your research. But also, besides all of that, maybe you're not like like myself or Jake here. If none of that sounds exciting, don't do it. Like figure out what's exciting yeah, to you sure. and go that direction. Like maybe you don't want to start a podcast about cults and extra Jehovah's Witnesses, but maybe you want to just I don't know, like you said paint or draw or take a dance class. If you're never if you weren't allowed to twerk like I wasn't in Mormonism, take a twerking class because <laughs> why not, right? Get to know why yourself, not? your body, mind, body, spirit. And it's all a personal journey and there's no right answer for everyone. So that's why I just like to get everyone's opinion who I bring on. What works for you? Maybe it'll work for our listeners. Maybe it won't. But it's just about showing that there is a range of possibilities here. Absolutely. Yeah. Just do stuff you like. Just do stuff you like. <laughs> and, and if you don't know what you like, then figure it out. Absolutely. So before we close this off, this has been an awesome conversation. I need to get your Linda Listen moment. Something that... You either want to say to someone who has pissed you off, you know, your sassy statement, or if you want to add some more amazing advice to our listeners, uh, whatever floats your boat. Okay. All right, listen, Linda. Let me, I'm going to describe a guy for you, Linda. I'm going to describe a person who is completely obsessed with their own name and their own reputation and only wants to hang out with people who absolutely agree with everything they tell them to do. And, in fact, thinks that people who disagree with him uh, should be murdered. Oh. That's a deal breaker, ladies. You don't want to be with a guy like that. And that's that's Jehovah. That's the kind of God that you are supposed to worship Plot as twist. a witness. That's a, that's a toxic guy. You want to get out of that kind of relationship. Oh, my gosh. I did not see that coming. That's great. Well done. Linda, listen. Set your priorities straight on maybe a type of God who loves you no matter what. I like it. Yes, exactly. I like it. Well, this has been amazing. Are there any final thoughts that you have before we close out? Oh, well, yes, because I, I don't know, I always like to say this, like, when I first um, went on my journey, you know, I, I, I married within the, the religion, and me and my wife were not on the same 
page at first. Obviously, she she didn't agree with my perspective. Um, you know, that's a really hard position to be in, and um, just uh, know that it can work. It really can. Uh, you can communicate. You can break down those barriers and, and find a relationship that is just purely based on your love for one another and not the things that you are kind of forced to have in common. Uh, so if you're in a situation like that, there's a good uh, post-Mormon podcast, or maybe not even post, because I think the wife is, is a believer still, uh, called Marriage on a Tightrope. That's really good. Um, and we had a couple friends who are witnesses on that recently, actually, if you want to listen to that. Um, mm. And you can always email me. But yeah, I don't know. I always like to say that because it's such a specific in tough uh, situation to be in but like my marriage is awesome stronger than ever and uh it really can work so if you're in a if you're in a tight spot it it does get better and it can it can and it will i love that that can be your linda listen 2.0 linda listen that's you're in right a mixed faith marriage it can work there are resources out there to help you and just keep on keeping on yeah <laughs> awesome well thank you so much jake for joining me uh we're gonna film our next video which should be out at the same time yes. on ways that mormons and jehovah's witnesses are similar and just like go in on that so tell everyone how they can find you how can they support you and watch all of the awesome jehovah's witnesses video Sure. Uh, I'm altworldly, uh, one word, on YouTube. I think I'm altworlder on TikTok. I don't know how that happened. That's <laughs> just me trying to be fancy or somebody had already taken the other thing. Um, and uh, same on, on Twitter, altworldly. And I have a Patreon, too, if you, you want to do that. with your, If you want to tithe 10% of your income to me, <laughs> that would be incredible. Amazing. Uh, Yes, subscribe to your Patreon, subscribe to mine. I have to pitch it now that I got one. That's right. And, um, Spread the wealth. you know, we're doing the thing. We're trying to make a difference out here. So we really appreciate your support. We're out there trying to make a buck. Thank you so much. Until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well. What a nice outro. That was so Thank great. Thank you. <laughs> we did it. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at cults to consciousness or reach out by email at cults to consciousness at gmail.com.